Thank you, nice people. And uh, I work with the .NET Interactive team. We are part of uh, DevTeam. And .NET Interactive pretty much is the idea to bring back uh, interactive programming. So in, in a shell, what .NET Interactive does is that you send code to that stuff, and that stuff does stuff with your code. The architecture at this point is that this is something that can be used in many different ways. Uh, and you can think, you know, interactive programming is a common thing that you might have come across with, with things like in a link pad, repulse, um, interactive Python, the um, the MongoDB shell, or, or you know, the uh, prompt, the, the Node.js, uh, REPL, and so on. So it's something that has been there for a while. And um, what the Net Interactive does is that builds an architecture for those things so that you can use it to power quite a few different things. And uh, one thing you're going to keep me, one term that's going to keep me, uh, keep me hearing and repeating is the term kernel, where usually the kernel is the smaller unit, which is actually the one that is able to do something. And in the Net Interactive, we got things that we call uh, language kernel, which is a kernel that you send in C-sharp, and it's going to evaluate the C-sharp, F-sharp, and PowerShell. We've got a few other kernels that we call them proxy, and we're going to see a couple of them so they connect you to another kernel, pretty much. And then we have kernel that are able to route things, understanding, you know, oh, if you're submitting this kind of command, this should go to this kernel, and so on. And... Um, this thing is accessible in many ways. One is that you could embed that as a as a use it as a library, but it's also compatible with few different protocols. And that's how we use uh, the net interactive to create a few experience. One of the uh, most common is what is called the net interactive notebook. Uh, are you familiar what with um, notebooks like Jupyter notebooks? So essentially, a Jupyter notebook looks like this and is a, is a is a thing that um was very common because the thing that you've got are blocks that are code you've got blocks that are just um markdown text and then the beauty was that uh this kind of format uh, is gonna enable you to produce not just text output but you can have plotting it could be interactive like this one and and so on this is a tool that really um, is not new. So this thing was um, born back in the days uh, in a company called uh, One Wolfram. So there was a uh, Mathematica and then MATLAB were the first experience where you have this uh, interactive um, areas where you write code and you get the output evaluated immediately in line. Then Jupyter came along and the Jupyter notebook were um, a way for uh, Python users to create documents that they can share because you can see the output right here and there. So you don't need to create an app to, to produce an output. And then again, Python being a low ceremony, ceremony um, kind of language, you will just drop in and, and do things. In this case, I'm just gonna show you one that I, I finish. Is that um, with this notebook, the idea is that I, I want to share with people a way for you to see you know, how my repo is doing. So this, for example, is a, is a notebook that is um, I would like to plot and query data that comes from uh, the GitHub repo of the .NET Interactive. You could create a web app or a WPF app or whatever you want, or essentially here what I do is that uh, I just have one single file. I can use commands or magic commands and these pound R that would be pulling in your NuGet package on the fly. I can add additional uh, NuGet sources so that sometimes you've got things that are only available within your company and so on. And then I can start using all those things. And as you can see, I don't need to create a program. I just go in here. I'm building a few variables. I'm building a GitHub client. I have imported a uh, few things. Plotly is going to give me a way to create plots. And um, then I build an authenticate with a client, and this is C-sharp. When I'm going through, querying GitHub to get data about branches, pull requests, and forks. And then at this point, I start using you know link to query that data, make my aggregation. I'm going to look in how long my, my pull request go, and then I'm building a dictionary by, you know, um, this is like an Instagram, how many have I got uh, for each uh, lifespan? 
I understand about forks. And then at this point, I write some other function going to help me to understand if an issue is a bug. Or in this point, I can group them by um, target area because I know the convention that I use for. So this is where I'm starting to try to understand the GitHub data. But um, I do all here. And at this point, I'm then jumping into Plotly. And I say, oh, I want to create some plot. I want to see, you know, um, using the, the issues, I want to see how many get created by month. I want to see how many get opened by month. And I want to see how many are closed by month. A few other things than like that. And then um, we're not going to go through the details of that. But and then in the end, I'm able to produce these charts when I can see the how many gets open and then how many are closed in each single day and how many gets created. So here you can see that the uh, my, my speed. <laughs> yeah, ideally you don't want to see the open count to keep on trending to the infinite. But this is a way for me to now query as a developer, I'm, I'm now you know putting up my, like a, a data scientist hat to understand how my, my repo is doing. Then again, here, I would like to have not many, but there is one bug. I know the guy that opened this one, I didn't fix it. It's been there for two years. <laughs> but you can see that, you know, the, the, the majority of bugs uh, tend to be leaving only one week or being closed within a sprint. And then again, open bugs by age, you can see that only very few uh, becomes really long-standing. Most of them gets closed quickly. And then this one is to see, you know, how those bugs um, are across to the area. So these are all my labels. And then another thing that was interesting here was to look at, you know, how long do I keep um, my, my PR open? Because I've got community contributing. And this one is showing that yeah, most of them gets closed in less than one week. And this is another interesting thing when I'm looking at how many times my, my repo gets forked, but I would like to know how many get actually updated. So here you can see that most of the, um, all the repo that gets created get also updated. So that means that probably not too many of these users are actually continuously realigning the, the main branch to the latest main, because you, you can see that here, the uh, create and last update are pretty much in sync, but the, the running total of uh, forks is growing. You would expect if, if you wanted to see a, a very engaged uh, community with you, you would expect um, the, the last update by month to hopefully have a shape closer to the running total than to the created by month. Because of course, every newly created repo is, uh, is updated. This is where these things usually get used. They're very common in um, if you if your company or you play with with uh, a little bit of machine learning. The first stage that you do is to understand what you've got in your hand. So you need tool to visualize your data set, see what you've got before you start preparing your steps for machine learning. And that's where most of this stuff is uh, is commonly used. And I want to show you few things are going to go step by step. But then again, please uh, be you're very welcome to, to start uh, jumping in. The main thing that we've got is that usually a notebook is a Python notebook and R notebook. But the Net Interactive is not opinionated about that. The Net Interactive, as you, when I was showing you the the architecture, we ship out of the box with C Sharp, F Sharp, PowerShell, but also JavaScript and HTML support. That's because the, it's quite common, that, you know, especially in this domain, uh, like, uh, like in LinkPad, your, your rendering surface is more close to a, to a web app. It's actually, this is a, it's a web view, so it's a DOM. So if you think about just one app here, you could have had the C sharp backend, 
then some layout management, and then you got your view logic. So in this case, these three cells that you see here, the first one is going to be routed to C sharp, and I'm declaring a variable. Now here I've got a div, which is empty. And now we see the C sharp cell. I'm actually going back into fetching the variable X from the C sharp kernel. And then I am modifying the div to have the content. These things usually are very commonly used in scenario where you, you merge a few of the cell. And you've seen before that we had those um, magic commands. So one other thing that I can do here is that I can do these two. And as you can see, as you start using these magic commands, you can switch between languages inside one single block. And the interactive and VS Code, they understand what's happening. So you see that the color changed because they, they now understand what's the language and they're starting to use uh, different things. So now when I run this cell, this, this old block gets... Um, executing one shot and you see that the output is here. So this one went through issuing the .NET command, then trying to add the HTML output, and then the execution of the cell completes when we leave this, this JavaScript. And this is how, to be fairly honest, the, when we say about sending a command, this object, like that is an entire command because it's also able to instruct the .NET interactive of what uh, type of languages I use inside this uh, code submission. And then the in the architecture at this point, the composite kernel, which is a routing kernel, is able to split them and orchestrate all the execution. Because we are in .NET, the thing that you might want uh, really uh, expect is to have uh, IntelliSense. And IntelliSense, again, it gets routed by the language. The other thing that here becomes quite interesting is that if you swap to PowerShell, and then I said doing completion, this is actually doing like you would expect in PowerShell, is now giving completion about the file system where the .NET Interactive is, is running. The reason for having this thing is that usually in this uh, notebook scenario, you also need, we're talking about like backend code, then we've got presentation code, then we've got view logic code. But commonly, and especially in the Python world, you have the automation aspect of all of that. So sometimes you could see that um, a classic usage for notebook is not only to um, execute beautiful logic and display, but sometimes you need to uh, manipulate uh, the environment, set environment, variable, manipulate files, download things. And yeah, you can do all of that in C Sharp or whatever you want. But of course, usually you see that people would tend in the, in the Jupyter kind of ecosystem drop into uh, using the bash commands. So you're now piping into, into the shell and PowerShell here is not using your PowerShell. This is coming with the PowerShell core. So every time you, you go around with the .NET Interactive, you get uh, the whole thing, even if you don't have uh, PowerShell or PowerShell code installed. So if you run this thing on Mac or Linux, this works exactly the same. Because all that part comes with the, with the experience. Any questions so far? I posted one in the chat about types. So um, how, how does it distinguish, or how does it change the types between the languages? So obviously like C sharp has decimals. Like if you go to JavaScript and say, get that variable. Oh, okay. So when, 
so we we had the concept that these are based on the fact that you can share values between between world. And I can show you a few other things in there. But when you share um, variables, the thing is that um, type system change will um, will have an impact. In this case, moving from the .NET world into a not .NET place involves what we call formatting. So this this whole ecosystem understands not only how to manipulate values, but also how to format them according to different mind types. And this means that um, behind the scene, acquiring a variable from the JavaScript world means to ask for this variable from C sharp with a MIME type of uh, application JSON. So at this point, if you are registered formatting, um, the, the formatter for types will come in. We have a lot of way to, to generate uh, formatting on the fly. For example, if I do, If I do anything like this, the default way to format these things is that if you have a trading expression, it will be evaluated and displayed. And the default behavior when you are in this configuration is that the default MIME type I would like to see is HTML. And the rule is that unless you define anything magic for this type, I'm going print out types like the R table, where the columns are the name of the properties and in the cell you get the values. And that the same thing will happen if I do oh my gosh, today is not my day. I don't type usually today in on Wednesdays because it's it's not good for me. Maybe not 100. Now at this point, if I make this thingy a trade expression, then this becomes more like a data frame or a table. So that means that at this point, if you're loading any any type of collection, dictionaries, dictionaries is a little bit more clever where instead of the index, you're gonna see the key. So on this part, you're gonna see the key and then you're gonna see for each object you've got across, it's gonna print out uh, each of the value. So that makes very easy to, and this is something that probably any of you that have been playing, you know, you are debugging, it becomes quite annoying. So somebody is, it goes the extra mile and creates custom debug viewer. But if you get that annoyed, usually you move into tools like in you know, a link pad. And that's where you, you leverage the fact that LinkPad can quickly show you uh, collections and things in this way. It means at this point, it's very easy for you to you know, load something with a web request and then deserialize the JSON and see what the thing does. Uh, any of you uses that kind of tools in, in, in the loop, like you know, to quickly prototype, how, how am I going to use this library? How, how should I shape this, this object? Have you been using anything like a link pad at all? Link pad is, is something is uh, like this tool becomes very addictive because uh, you could jump in loading a NuGet package right there and then immediately start to using and even connect to databases and pull data. For me personally, you know, if you're thinking about how do I, how am I going to query this one, you know, unless you start building your unit test where you're trying to connect to a database and try out uh, link expressions, I would go into tool like the net interactive or link part to understand, especially when I'm using libraries like um, 
reactive extension, all these things that you have this uh, expression tree to transform your object like a, like a SQL query, I tend to use tool like this one to quickly prototype. Or another place where I usually use this one is when I'm trying to come up with a way to serialize custom object in JSON. I would use tool like this to prototype. Then at the end, this is all super valid C sharp that, that I can bring over to, to my tool. See if I've got interesting one I wanted to show. I don't have it here, but I can. So variable sharing, this is an interesting scenario. In, like you've seen, we've got a few different kernels, but the thing that is quite interesting is when you are able to use tools or languages that are, you know, in, in the F-sharp domain, you're going to find tons of libraries that have been designed for F-sharp, which becomes very succinct and easy to use if you try to do things like, you know, data frame manipulation. So F-sharp is really focused around the, uh, the classic functional programming vibe, which is mostly used by, by scientists. So a lot of things like manipulating, filtering, mapping, reducing collection, they have a much more um, elegant way. And the tons of libraries that people use for uh, uh, statistical data generation and so on. And this is to go back to um, also your question, Kevin, about you know what happens to the, value, to the values. In this case, because I'm declaring an X as a um, CLR type, I can also use this one to now consume the X from C sharp into F sharp. And this is the way F, this is the console break line equivalent of F sharp. And you can see that I have printed out the value of X from F sharp. But because these things are uh, .NET types, they are actually sharing the same reference. And then to show you that is that I create a list and I call it list in F sharp and I put a value in. Now I go back and I get it in F sharp. Now list exists in, in C sharp too. I'm adding a value. And you can see that the original value was there, is there, then added a new one. But to prove to you that those things are shared by reference because it's done a type within the same process, then the F sharp state of the collection reflects the, the operation I've done through C sharp. The, the reason for having that kind of functionality is that we also have a kernel, which is a, is it a key value pair that we call hash bank value. How many times have you, somebody sent you a bunch of XML or a bunch of text, which is a, you know, a CSV or tab separated value or a JSON, and you needed to do stuff with it in, um, in your code. And then of course you go down the, the annoying uh, escaping and quoting of, of all the uh, JSON literals. But here, using the value, I can just put here a raw value and give it a name. So at this point, I don't need to escape this JSON. This is something I could just get uh, just straight out of the, you know, the clipboard or whatever you've got or a text file. This is how it looks like. You put it here, you don't need to think about how that needs to be escaped. Now using share from C sharp, I'm gonna pull from the value kernel, this some JSON, and then using Newton soft, I'm gonna pass it and show you that I was able to consume that object. Then I'm gonna show you a few other things with the uh, I don't have, I can also load it from disk. 
then again, I have it out, but I can even fetch it. Now this one, of course, is going to print out the raw HTML of the .NET page. So you can just quickly, you can see how this one could be your way to load, uh, you know, CSV or any other form of uh, of data straight from URL file, bring it into the notebook, but then immediately being uh, addressable by any of the other kernel. That wasn't clever. <laughs> Cool example. But a, in this case, I do something a little bit more because so far everything has been treated as a piece of uh, literal text. But here I'm telling that this value is JSON. And now the difference is that it's not just printing out some text. This is using the built in uh, JSON formatting. So where it understands the structure, you can collapse and expand. Um, child items and and uh, the graph of, of that object. And these two are the core building block of the .NET Interactive. You've seen the notebook, and then I'll show you another thing that uh, John, who's the tech lead of the team, has done where this is not the only way that this engine is uh, is useful. In this scenario, this the, the .NET Interactive is running as a standalone process where you're sending commands by a standard IO from um, from VS Code, but you can take those libraries and embed in your own app. So now you're making your own system uh, scriptable. Any questions so far or things that you would like to see? Yeah, that's very cool, Diego. Um, just on that last point, uh, uh -huh. you're currently using VS Code. Um, what's the support like for other other IDEs like uh, Visual Studio and Rider? Too soon to answer that question. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Rob. Uh, IDE that we're working on at the moment, uh, this was an initiative we started with um, trying to meet uh, data scientists and bring .NET developers into that kind of field. So the IDE that today works in front of uh, .NET Interactive are uh, um, things like the uh, Jupyter, Jupyter Lab, Interact. So those are all things that comes from the Python and uh, NAM Focus um, foundation, where usually you would have found, you know, R, Scala, uh, Python, and, and Julia, and we bring uh, through the uh, Jupyter protocol format, we bring that to there. You can see that um, this is how, uh, I don't know if you, uh, any of you had experience with the uh, Spark.net or, uh, or the Azure Synapse um, offering, which is, a, th those are the classic things that you would have done with Spark and Scala, but you've got also the .NET implementation of those services. They are powered by uh, .NET Interactive. And then the VS Code. Now, Visual Studio is here in the line because we there are things that of interest, but again, in in the VS Code and Jupyter kind of ecosystem, the vast majority of people meeting these these blocks are cross-platform developer and a lot of people that they tend to do more like uh, data preparation, data cleaning, feature engineering. VS Code is a, is a much more hybrid uh, scenario because then you bring up backend developer, uh, all sorts of uh, developer. Spartanet is big data people. And of course, when you're going to Visual Studio, now you're talking something I'm going to show you later. But this is more like the, you know, the enterprise developer uh, kind, of, kind of profile. And you, you tend to use now notebooks as an exploration, but usually they get bound to activities like uh, troubleshooting guides. So the, you know, you you got some form of issue going on 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 your system, and the way you you automate and and become consistent in your um, investigation is to actually have a notebook to execute. So you're going through uh, a sequence of um, um, 
repeatable and reproducible steps to gather insight of what's going on on your app. Those, for example, could be interesting uh, experience to light up also in IDEs like you know, Visual Studio, you were mentioning Rider. But in the, in the case, the hosting mechanism is slightly different because you would like to be more like, um, we've done a few crazy things in terms of IoT and uh, another embedding where the, the host itself, like the IDE, is exposed inside the net interactive as a variable. So at this point, for example, you could imagine that in the, when we did IoT, you were having the notebook, you were submitting code, but you were able to access the device itself because the device was showing itself as a .NET object inside the system. So it was part of your environment. So you could um, read sense and do things directly from there. And in, in IDEs, you could be uh, using this kind of technology in, in a hybrid scenario, like debugging, but as you are debugging, you know, as opposed to the immediate code, here's when you start sending much more complex commands so that they can plot out specific state of the app. These, for example, is a little bit more down what Europe said, because this is a console app, it's a repo. .NET Interactive is embedded inside. And at this point here, I've got Oops. Of course, I need it. And then at this point, I can do. about declaration. And that this is the same engine you've seen before. It's only that being here, the default MIME types is uh, VT100. So now we're using terminal rendering. But it's exactly the same thing you've seen before. But this thing is importing .NET Interactive as NuGet package in your own app. It's exactly the same engine. It can do exactly the same things that you've seen. And there's a, a cool blog, let me put it here, from um, Scott Hanselman when I was playing, because then it's loading NuGet packages. And then the other lab is that try to render PNGs as, as blocks. Very, very, very useful. <laughs> you can imagine. But um, this is a way of how this tool is built. And it's yet, leveraging these, these part where they get embedded into, into systems. The Batman. The .NET Try ready are available now, or not? Uh, sorry? You know the .NET Try? Can you embed that into your own website yet? Do you know? Uh, not yet. So the so the net try and the net interactive uh, the, is the same team. The um, so the the execution model is slightly different, but the design of the net interactive is derived from a lot of experience that we had in the net try. So the the reason. The reason of embedding on your own website is that you that when you run .NET try on the web, you are executing, you are compiling on the backend, but executing through um, WebAssembly. The, the problem at this point becomes how to author your dependency graph. Compared to the, the main thing that you were seeing here is that I was able to just go and start importing packages on the fly. And this simple action is something that uh, .NET try 
cannot do the moment. So that's why the net try is um, the one that you see now is hosted. You can embed it on your own because you can run in hosted mode, but then it means that if you got custom experiences, I've seen um, I've seen few experiences uh, like um, one. Well, people are embedding it in their own website, but that means you are hosting your own uh, runtime. And um, when, you, when you try this, this system, they have their own environment set up. I'm not going to register. But essentially, the problem is that to, to be able to, here is using these types that are defined in their own NuGet package. For that, for you to be able to do this one, the net try is not yet able to let you load dynamically. So there, 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 there are a few things in, uh, in store where we are looking at how these two technology converge and the architecture of, of kernels and the execution as a client-side kernel, like in this case, the, uh, the WASM kernel can be then used by you. And that means also you, the user, the, the experience author can create any custom experience with any custom uh, package loading. Right now, you have to create using uh, part of our tooling, a Blazor runner for your NuGet package so that when you publish this, it's able to fetch uh, all your dependencies. It's not exactly as easy as doing a, a, the, a pound R uh, in a notebook. And then also the net try wasn't designed around essentially evaluating your code. So if you do any long running, it's not really pushing updates as you go. So for example, uh, what is it? Let me show you one thing. This was one of the reasons why we wanted to do um, the, the, the net interactive experiments is because In this example, in this notebook, I am creating um, a custom commands. Now here, you see that in JavaScript, I'm telling how to handle a smart home command. Then I'm defining a few um, types that I need. This is C-sharp, and this essentially is all about uh, monitoring an IoT scenario. With, here there is a house with um, thermostat and, 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 and temperature reading from inside or outside of the house. And the, the thermostat, you can set it as on or off, depending on that. And then these people build a very, very cool visualization for the system. And now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to pump values by sending these custom commands to the JavaScript kernel, the hundred that you've seen above is gonna just post those commands. It's gonna start changing the state of the UI depending on the values being read. The dam was broken. <laughs> Let me try again. Gods, gods of the demo.
have an old version. Sorry, I should have tried this demo. But the, the other one I can show you, even though it's not as compelling as that one, is that if you got visualization going on in, um, in the .NET try, you will submit the code, it will get compiled, it will get executed, and then you'll see all the output when that thing is finished. In this case, as I run this code, the value of the display starts getting updated as the code is going because now it's all dynamic. So the there are a few things that where we want to make those two experience um, converge so that this this kind of um, user experience for documentation and and again they they fulfill a slightly different scenario. Usually in a notebook, you will see all everything that runs is in front of you either because you have loaded um, with the by loading a package with the with the pound dar uh, signature or it is here because it is here in the code in the night try you are able to hide some of the setup so you can really get the user to focus on a small fraction, everything has been set up before and after. So you can do the same here, but of course, it's, um, this doesn't contain any hidden content. All that make up this file, it is actually in front of you. So this will not lend itself to experience like the uh, Donna try markdown. So the, they will converge, hopefully very soon. Any question? Because otherwise, I want to show you one scenario that I really like. This is what we presented um, at the MVP summit, where the, the scenario here is that we own a website, we're selling stuff. We are, of course, the AdventureWorks kind of company. And um, users are starting to fill up feedback, uh, complaining about stuff is slow. And therefore, some pages are slow. So the user, I've got some JSON from them. So then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to parse it. And then through, the, through my extension, I have loaded an advanced way to to visualize data, hopefully. I have HTML problem today. Let me let me restart as usual. Okay.
is working. So the interact is a is this, this thing is a component that comes from the interact the data viewer and it lets you visualize tabular data and then also trying to do a few uh, if we're looking at the this one for example I'm looking at the graph trying to group the uh, all the different URL and then at this point on the other side I want to group them by understanding what what's the reason for these things being reported and all of them were slow and that's okay then at this point I am going to just look at the server logs and I'm looking at the responses and really these responses are not too bad. Now the, the longest one is 21 milliseconds. So here I 24 actually. So I don't see anything uh, too awkward. And that's where the connect you've seen before. So we're talking about these um, this package. So this is also, I don't know if you never noticed on, if you go on, on NuGet, the, when you see this, you know, script and interactive, that's actually what you need. Wow. Not good for me tonight, because the <laughs> updating also Visual Studio doesn't have. Okay. No luck. Am I going short? I'm really sad about it. <laughs> yeah, That's... May I? Yep. yep. May I ask a more general question? Uh, yes. just for the moment, which is I teach at the university and largely I nowadays teach students who are just beginning their career in computing. So they're learning the programming languages and learning the packages. At what stage would you recommend that they start learning about packages such as .NET Interactive? Oh, should I now go full, um, full PR? Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna do commercial pitch. So uh, when it comes, so the, when it really depends on what you teach, and usually the problem when 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 teaching is really the the learning curve of both the subject you're trying to teach, but then you know you wanna teach, you don't want to become the the IT uh, person in the room. Oh, prof, this thing it doesn't work. So the notebook experience, generally speaking, including Python they they all come into this place because now you start learning and you're teaching them to do things with code without having to understand uh, how to create a, a visual studio solution what's the right project to get what so you just go really straight into let's write a class and really they start with a public class and off you go so notebooks so these kind of things i don't know interactive and, and and then again if you see a few experiences like uh you know jupyter notebook 
that's where they really come in handy for in, in education because you focus the the attention of the student on what you're trying to get them on. So really digesting the um, IT skill set of designing um, a data structure of um, understanding a switch, understanding. Then as they keep on going, of course, you know, the, the console red line is cool, but to an extent, you ask the student to sort an array, you would like to see the things nicely printed, or maybe you want them to understand how to plot a bi-dimensional data set. And that's where all these things come into place because the, the next level, if you were to do the more kind of, you know, traditional teaching, like when I was young, uh, you know, I had to do C, uh, C, C++ and going from my console red line to, 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 to a bar <laughs> chat, <laughs> it was too complicated. Now you've got all these things out of the box and a lot of API is very simple for them to use. So I would say that it's pretty easy. The other thing is that, uh, that, uh, do you actually have any experience of do you actually have any experience of this being used within the introductory period? Uh, no, but I'm, I would be really interested to see because there are two uh, pieces here. Scott, with Scott Hansen, man, we have created. I was working this team. These um, these education bundles. Essentially, you, you have just one installer and the student gets all that he needs. And if they don't have, um, you know, depending on the school, they might not have uh, admin rights and things like that. So mm -hmm. here, even the .NET SDK is installed by this one, but it runs a user space. So there is no mm -hmm. uh, elevation things to be done. This comes also with uh, already the extension that you need. So .NET Interactive, all that stuff is installed by the time you finish. Then I have a project, which is this thing, which again, this is a, we are working on this at the moment, it's called Journey. Journey essentially is, um, is a way to use the notebook to create a learning experience as opposed to going through, you know, a gigantic document and, and asking the students now do this, now do this. The, the first thing that the student is going to see is exactly this. Essentially, once you have journey, you point the student to a lesson and the lesson is a notebook itself. Yes. What, what happens with this thing is that we had the concept of, um, of challenges. So as you go through the, uh, I don't have this compiled at the moment. This extension is not yet. Oh, wait, wait a second. Let me see if I can. This, we're just in this at the moment. This was a project that we did with few interns in the in the last week. So what happens here is that every time the student is submitting something, you have the control on giving feedback and also deciding what to do next. Mm -hmm. So the exercise that is here is a classic things where we, um, we've done few work. We we get um, students to learn how to use object oriented programming to model geometry. So you start asking to create a triangle, but then you as a teacher, every time they submit, you have access to the execution that they've done. So you can see, oh yeah, the class is good. Now let's put the properties. That needs to be like this. And then you, you keep giving feedback and really have them to, to go through these um, step-by-step tutorials. But instead of being like the, the notebook that I showed you before, the one that you scroll, this starts empty. And the, the, the student goes through the, um, through the experience step by step. That also means that you have control on when they move to the next step, how, 
And also, what is the next step? Because you could have a collection of challenges. And every time you have a challenge, your code gets executed before the student. So you could imagine that, you know, you could uh, set them up uh, if you are, you know, if, if you feel comfortable declaring these experiences uh, as uh, a bunch of unit tests that they go through, you could really say, oh, before the student going off, I'm going to create a collection. Then the student needs to create this, um, this code to go through the collection and find out which elements uh, have missing values. And then at this point, once you got this function, you can, you can, as a teacher, run that thing and then make the assertion like you were doing with Fluent Assertion or any other libraries that you like to do and give back the feedback like, oh, I was expecting you to find this element, but you only found this one. And then you can give feedback on how to improve or move to something else. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy, uh, Matthew, if, if, you, if any of you actually wants to look at this one, I would need to do something a little bit more um, specific to show you how this works. And the whole point is that if you are, if you are able to write C sharp and create notebooks, this is the notebook is what? creates the teaching experience. So you don't need, you know, for, for them to code, you're not going to a tool and create uh, a JSON graph. You are writing the same things and you as a teacher can run it and see how, because you also have the abilities to create a um, reference solution. The student will never see that, but you can run it and see, oh, if the student gives a, a wrong answer, I give the feedback. If the student's giving me the right answer, I give this other feedback. And is all the back end is a normal notebook. It's only that we treat some of the um, some of the um, markdown element in a slightly different way because what happens is that um, if you are a teacher, when I see something like a a question. This markdown that you see here will be prompted on the student. So the student will, uh, as is, is starting your, your lesson, say, oh, in this challenge, we'll be writing an algorithm. So these things will automatically appear in, in the student notebook. Then this one, for example, you are setting up just a skeleton. And then this thing that we call scratch pad, uh, where you try out different answers then once you've got the rules, if that challenge is passed, then you have the new challenge, which is DFS. And here you've got the new question, that first traversal. And then this is what the student will see coming up as soon as he's able to, to pass the previous challenge, he moves to the next step of, the, of these guided learning and tutorials that, that you write. And you have access to all the stuff that uh, any notebook user uh, would do, so, you know, HTML visualization, or all those things. But you can really keep the student focused on the question you're asking step by step, as opposed of you know gigantic exercise or think how how to set up the environment and, and everything. So with, with those two tools, you can create any sort of uh, experience it doesn't have to be complicated by you know you, you can go from the introduction kind of material all the way into advanced machine learning because you're giving them access to the whole .NET SDK so there is no um, explicit limitation on what you as a, as a tutor can model and what a student can do You're gonna join us for a, for a pilot. Uh, I think I'm going to need to refer to colleagues, but I'll be interested to to explain what I've seen today. If I'm really happy, if you want to, um, if any of you wants to uh, address more into the space of of um, of the education bit, 
And uh, again, if you have to talk with colleagues and you want to organize anything with your colleagues, feel free to um, um, reach out to me. And I'll be very, very happy to, uh, to go through and, and meeting with, um, with, with you and your colleague to expand on this one any any moment thank you for the i wasn't expecting in this uh in this context uh, a question about the teaching part it's very welcome i was trying to go more down the uh the developer experience but um the the education and learning generally speaking the learning experience doesn't have to be uh school is something at the moment where really looking very close how to use these technologies for people to explore API, learn packages, integrate into approaches and, and so on. Are we doing with time? Sorry, the digression on, on education was longer. Uh, whatever you fancy really, I guess. Uh, so Net sniping not... worked very well. <laughs> Good job there, really. So we can do like another 10 minutes until like eight o'clock if you want to, and we'll wrap up then. Um, Unless you want to stop now, oh, either way. No, I mean, okay, uh, one, one thing I wanted to share with you is uh, let me fetch, um, I have um, a list where I tend to collect what we do, but also other people do in, um, with Net Interactive. And here you're going to find out also a few um, not so classic scenario like the one I was talking about the um, you have embedded, you have devices and you are actually now scripting and connecting to remote devices. This when I was talking about this topology, you all that you've seen was running in process. But when you start having connection, you you fan out and you connect to things that might be running anywhere. So at this point, same process, out of process, out of your machine, the, the way you can connect kernels is, is quite open. And the reason for that is uh, sometimes you want to move them because of uh, security concerns, but sometimes you need to move. You can imagine you have a, you know, a C-sharp kernel, but if in, your, if in your company, you need there is some code that needs to have um, some you know, special GPU acceleration, some resources that are only available when you're running on a specific node. At this point, you just connect your donor interactive to, to that kernel. And now the thing becomes available to you in, in your document. So at this point, you could be submitting C sharp instead of running the local on your machine. You could be using the way you've got um, all the environments set up for, you know, I don't know, GPU accelerated or an NX, or if you need to have access to a machine that's got um, the ability to capture data from a camera in a very specific scenario, that's where these things come into place. Because from your point of view, all the output is routed back always to the front end. So if you were to, to capture an image anywhere in that topology, the event of the image being produced will flow all the way to your VS code and you'll see that on your screen. I put them in the chat. There's quite a few videos if you want to see some some of the scenario. And then again, um, some of these videos see with they're not even with VS Code. You'll see this as a with the Jupyter front end, which is more classically used by data scientists. And then there's also a couple of them where the front end is Teams. That's how we are uh, collaboratively programming one single machine which is uh, uh, like a, almost a live share on steroids because everybody can evaluate a runtime code and bring stuff in and modify the state of the application. So we were um, creating the logic for, um, for, a, for a rover by submitting across the world code to the rover and get the, while the rover was running. So we're doing a live uh, code changes to the, to the machine for fun.
that posted the the repo, sorry, the uh, the repo where you you can find out all how to um, install and deploy, and um, that's it. As an introduction to this, then you know there's so many different things that you I don't know what's all of you different scenarios where you work, what kind of things you you tend to do was uh, you know between what you're doing a private project or at work, how interactive programming and an interactive could fit is a is a wide spectrum of uh, of needs and experiences. Anything that comes to mind, like um, do you have any of you got any question about I do this? Can I use this to do X? It, is it really just a case of letting your imagination go wild and you, you can really just go I'll crazy like, with this? <laughs> I'll buy into that, Rob. Yeah. Yeah, but, but and still though, remember here, we always thought about exploring the, the whole goal of uh, this, this kind of programming is to be able to explore and treat code and data roughly the same way. So this is, you know, as opposed of you can explore things like, you know, with Excel or SQL Management Studio, for example, the same thing that you do with data like, can be done with code because uh, with the fact that you can just, you don't need to stop it to, to redefine the class. If you keep running, every time you declare uh, classes of variables, those things get um, rehydrated. So if, if I start, you know, I do this and then you see that is they, they get namespaced by the submission. There was the fourth submission. And here if I do Again, if I do now, oops, sorry, because he's doing hiding. Now I only have one Dean scope, but then I've just hidden. So that's that's the shadowing of the previous type and the previous variable. So you could just, and you don't even need to do this. You could just do, I do this and I do this. So that's really any order. As a, you know, as a way for you to be a scratch power, you playing with the shape. Again, parsing is one of the first things that comes to mind. <laughs> JSON, JSON parsing, and things like that is the classic. Thing. You either do it through um, some serious unit testing that you've built, or you can just come in here. And you know, like when I was showing you the the the, the literal kind of things, you could have just come in here and says, I need to know how to parse this.
you can really just build this value and then And here, if you can see, I've got completion of what variable I can see. So IntelliSense is also working with commands, not only with uh, And you can start building out your, you know, your strongly types and see how they, they map to those. And I've done this in four lines, as opposed to having to bootstrap something, or at least bare minimum, a, a unit test project to, to start running and, and play around with this. Same applies to you. If you start doing a lot of things where you need to interact with um, web backends again, if you're doing the Java skin here, you could start prototyping your JS client to work with, um, with uh, some REST API backend very easily. Those, those were, at least those are the kind of scenario where I usually tend to gravitate around here. If the goal is to present your findings and not building an app, I come here more than going to create a console app because I can give you this file. And because any dependency that I need is gonna be declared in my document. This is more reproducible than, oh, I give you a binary. Oh, but I didn't do publish or I didn't do pack. Now to compile this thingy, you might need quite a few gigabytes of things to be on your machine and you need to have them up front. That's the, the, the usual scenario where I go here. It's a lot easier to collaborate, a lot easier to share and explore. Unless you are a data scientist and that this becomes, this is what you do. That's your, that's your visual studio, uh, pretty much. But otherwise, I'm a software engineer. I don't do, uh, data scientist job, but I need to be able to do these kind of things, investigate bugs. And um, another classic things is that uh, if you use libraries here, um, there are some very interesting uh, things that you can do. Like I was using the uh, diagnostic runtime and this library here, it tries to, um, to, to the bug itself and profile this one I'm profiling the net interactive itself. And then I would plot it. So this for me was how I was looking for um, memory leaks. And I think I'm really done this time. 